Okay, so um, uh, good evening, everybody. Um, well, welcome to this evening's webinar uh, concerning our MSc in flood risk management. Um, my name's uh, Daniel Parsons. I'm a professor of sedimentology at the university, and I also direct the the Energy and Environment Institute here at here at the university, which is the home for the for, for this master's program. Um, the institute brings together um, in an interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary way a whole range of of, of, of drivers around the impacts of climate change on society um, and, and the way in which we're adapting and mitigating the, those impacts into, into the future. And of course, um, flood hazard and risk is central um, in, terms, in terms of those, those hazards and risks that, that many societies globally face. So this program is, is, is from that ethos, it's from that interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary ethos that looks to fuse together the, the science, um, the, 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 the physical sciences of, of flooding, right the way through to the social and the cultural aspects as well. And, and you'll hear about all of that from, 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 from the team this, this evening. Um, so, so yeah, just warmly welcome you to the uh, to the webinar tonight. Um, we're, we're, we'll present um, through the program um, the, the 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 options, the way in which the, the program runs, its content, and and, and the various aspects thereof. Um, there is a Q and A opportunity at the end, and an opportunity to put your questions um, into into the um, into the boxes within the within the software. So that we'll pick those up at, at the end as we go through. So so welcome once again, and I'll pass over to to Stephen Forrest, who's the the program director who will who will lead the webinar onward and I'll, I'll I'll see you all at the end for the q a thank you there Dan and hello everyone and welcome to this webinar on the MSC and flood risk management um, I'm thrilled to be here to talk to you more about this exciting course at the University of Hull I'm joined today with Dan who you've just met and also with Tom uh, they're both involved and engaged in the course delivering um, teaching materials uh, throughout. What I'd like to do today is talk to you, oh sorry, before we go into it, um, if you have any questions then as Dan suggested please put them into the questions box, the Q&A, and what we'll do, uh, Tom will be collecting them and we'll look at them and we'll go through them at the end of the webinar. Uh, I think the webinar will take about 30 minutes of me describing and presenting the course, the overview and what will actually be taught on the pro programme and then we have the Q&A session. So we've got a lot of time for questions, so please don't hold back, post your questions, and we'll come back to them at the end. So we'll kick off the webinar, and really, um, as you can see here, a unique opportunity to shape the future of flood management. That's where we really think, or where we really try and place this MSC in flood risk management. So let's start. In this webinar, we will be looking at why flood risk management is important. We've got a short video on the student experience and employer views. I'll go through what we actually teach and I'll emphasize details about it, which make it a flexible and inclusive course. We'll then end with the summary and the Q&A. So when we think about flooding, we may all have our own experiences, having seen it in the newspaper, having seen it on the news, or maybe even having lived through a flood event. Uh, there are of course floods in the UK and you cast your mind back to last summer and you, you may remember London was flooded and it affected the tube system and it affected a large number of commuters and people living in those areas. But this is a global issue, it's not just flooding in the UK that's covered in the course. There's also been recent floods in East Africa, in Malaysia, and they affected at least 700,000 people. Also floods in Malaysia only a few weeks ago and already in 2022, I know the 13th of January, there have already been floods in Brazil, which have affected many people and caused a lot of disruption. It's a global issue. And that really links into why you should study flood risk management. It's taken very seriously at all at an international level. And you can see this um, through the work done by the UNDRR, the UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction. Who focus on who have areas focusing on flood risk management and how we can make more flood resilient places. Flooding and flood risk management is also important in the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction that goes from 2015 to 2030. You may have also heard of the United Nations Paris Climate Agreement and of course the Sustainable Development Goals, 17 goals to transform our world. All of these 
are linked to flood risk management and flood risk management contributes to each of these global policies. Overall, to summarize, it's a globally important topic. And we see this also, it's not only a globally important topic at present with the recent floods, but it's also something that's predicted to increase in future with greater flood risk with, I think by 2050, an estimated 2 billion people likely to be vulnerable to flood disasters and hundreds of millions likely to, to be displaced by water disasters, stresses and shocks. And this is from a range of different factors from climate change to urbanization, urban growth, as well as inappropriate development on our floodplains. And when we're thinking about this future flood risk, we're really considering and reflecting on how best to manage flooding. Should we do as we've done in the past and simply erect barriers to keep the flood waters out? Or should we transition and think about it differently and think about building natural flood defenses upstream? in order to try and slow the flow of water, as you can see in this image, uh, the second image. However, whatever we do, we need to really consider flooding and flood management strategies in a more holistic way. And these need holistic approaches to catchment management and this idea of living with water. And we can't just continually try to stop the water and hope that we can contain the risk and the, haz the hazard itself. We need to be accepting that we can't prevent every flood. We need to now think what will happen when it does flood, how can we reduce the consequences? And with this living with water idea, it's also about engaging with society to build resilience to flood events. And I want to emphasize this again, this again, flooding is an urgent issue for society. These are just some images and screenshots from the UK context. You can see in the first image is really about um, some of the extreme flood events we've seen recently, the Storm Dennis floods in 2020, they led to questions over the status quo, questions of the capability of flood defences and how our money is being spent. This again is about whether we should be only focusing on building these defences or if we need a more holistic approach. We also need to think about effective flood incident management. Uh, the SNAIF image you can see is talking about the snaith flooding a year after the flood so the snaith floods happened in february 2020 100 homes were affected however a year later some residents hadn't returned home yet and were still being housed in temporary accommodation so we need to think how we can manage the flood incident and also about recovery after a flood and flooding is especially important in the uk context with it predicted to be the next major housing scandal, at least that's what MPs have warned, with the number of new homes built on floodplains potentially rising by 50% over the next 50 years. So it is a societally urgent issue that's going to get worse in the future. And that brings us on, why should we study flood risk management? Well, not only is it a societally important issue, something that's increasing or you're going to get worse in the future. In the UK, there's been a 16 centimetre sea level rise since 1900. It's also expected that temperatures will be warmer and um, there might be up to 60% more precipitation in winter by 2050. That with a, pro a prediction of 1.15 metre sea level rise by 2100 suggests that there's going to be even more homes, properties and businesses at risk of flooding in the future. And we need to come up with better ways to protect these homes and to make more flood resilient places. If we look to the recently published strategy on flood risk management for England, and we can see that they're aiming for a nation ready for and resilient to flooding and coastal change today, tomorrow, and to the year 2100. And this is from the Environment Agency's National Flood and Coastal Erosion Risk Management Strategy for England. This shows the importance attached to flood risk management in policy and by policy makers. So a key challenge in the future will be not only facing this increasing flood risk, but also finding ways to manage it, coming up with creative and innovative solutions. And that's really 
why we need more people to be studying flood risk management. And that's also one of the things that we that we'd um, encourage you to be doing, and obviously want you to be doing this on the course, because we need to enable society to be more resilient in the face of growing risks. We need to develop and deliver these new approaches to flood risk management. And we need, as D uh, Professor Dan Parsons mentioned at the beginning, we need to think beyond individual disciplines. We need to think about the social and the physical sciences. And that's one of the benefits of this program. We really try and look at it from a multidisciplinary approach. We also really look at the theory and how we can apply it. So we try and bridge the theory and practical and practice divide so that you'll not only get a better understanding of flood risk management and what we can do but you're in the theory but, and looking at current research, but you'll also see how you can do it in practice and you'll be engaging with policy and practitioners throughout the course in order to understand what is actually being done outside of the university. And Hull is really the place for flood studies. And you can see this uh, in the innovative um, partnership, the Living with Water partnership that exists in Hull and East Riding, which is a partnership, including the University of Hull and our institute, but also with Yorkshire Water, with Hull City Council, and with a range of different actors, all from different sectors, but coming together to try and tackle this issue of flooding together. And this is really important in Hull because outside of London, the Humber is the region with the greatest flood risk to the economy. So London first and then the Humber, so that includes Hull. We've got a high amount of flood risk and it's a really pressing issue here that needs to be dealt with or needs to be managed. Another reason is linked to the Rockefeller Foundation, Arab's Global City Water Resilience Framework. Now, this is um, a framework that includes five cities internationally, and Hull has been chosen as one of these cities. So this is developed by Arab and supported by the Rockefeller Foundation. But this is essentially meaning that Hull is a focus for water resilience and by extension for flood resilience. Hull has also been described as a living lab for flood risk management. And you can see it from these images here. We have enormous, uh, the enormous Hull Tidal Third Barrier, this technical engineering solution for flood risk management, which you'll be able to see and which we discuss in the course itself. This is to protect against tidal flooding. And we also have the £42 million Hull Frontage Scheme. And this was essentially. Um, uh, a scheme to protect the city against tidal surges, surges by heightening the protection works along the estuary. We also look on the more individual level and the community level with flood risk management work, such as the floodgates, which are along the frontage scheme, and these are ready to be quickly closed or opened as necessary. And we have the property level protection measures, PLP approaches, which store water on individual properties or help to protect individual properties against flooding. All of these forms of flood and risk management are on display across Hull and which we'll also talk about in the course. Now, what I'd like to do is just to share a video with you on the student experience and on employers' views. So I'm going to share that now. Here in Hull, there's a lot of research on natural systems and challenges such as climate change and flood risk. And I'm excited to contribute to these studies. So the benefits of studying in Hull is definitely that there are a lot of applied and fundamental projects related to issues such as flood risk and climate change. And this results in a lot of knowledge from different perspectives. I get involved in flood risk projects and environmental projects all over the world. Uh, but it's great to talk a little bit about the MSc in flood risk management at Hull. Uh, Hull is just one of the, the, the best places that you could come to study about flood risk management. All different aspects of flood risk that you could encounter around the world are, are here in Hull. Flooding is the most recorded natural disaster on this planet. In the last two decades alone, 2 billion people 
a third of the population of this globe has been impacted in one way or another by a large scale flood event. The opportunities in this sphere of the world right now are endless. It's the place to be and it's the place to be for me because you can impact the lives of generations now and in the future. I think it's really important to study natural flood management because it's something that's only going to get worse in the future. So it's important that we learn to be able to live with flooding and sort of manage floods, but also be able to mitigate, to be able to reduce the negative impacts like loss of life and destruction of infrastructure. I was a partner in the development of the world leading city water resilience approach with the Rockefeller Foundation, the Resilience Shift, World Bank and Arab. And Hull is a global pilot city for that initiative. At Hull, we have a whole host of experience from both academic and industry partners, as well as access to high resolution survey grade equipment, such as drones, the terrestrial laser scanner, as well as the total environment simulator. Being within the Energy and Environment Institute has also been really great. Uh, being constantly surrounded by so many postgraduate researchers and lecturers with such a broad knowledge base and a wide variety of fields. I look forward to completing my PhD and to having a career within the research industry and helping towards a more sustainable future. Every place experiences flood risk in different ways, so flood risk management opportunities across the UK vary from place to place. That being said, there are common areas of opportunity within risk management authorities and across the wider sector. As a company, Arup, we, we recruit a large number of graduates each year and we're always looking for good people who know their subject, who are good team workers, but also people who are able to understand the community, politicians, stakeholders, and to translate those aspirations into technical solutions. Hello again, hopefully uh, you also, I, I hope you enjoyed that video, just showing some of the benefits from this course and also the importance of flood risk management and how societally important it is uh, for now and in the future. So that was the video itself and I just wanted to show a few more faces on the screen so you'll have a bit of an idea on the teaching team who will be part of the MSc in flood risk management and who will be running various modules and also delivering guest lectures in the course. We have uh, Stuart McClelland, who's the Deputy Director of Energy and Environment Institute, who specializes in physical modeling of flow processes and sediment. We have uh, myself, I'm a lecturer in flood resilience and sustainable transformations. I'm focusing more on the environmental risk management and the governance aspects of flood resilience. We have Tom, who you saw earlier, who's in charge of our Q&A. So if you have any more questions, please do post them uh, in the Q&A bar and we'll get back to them at the end of the presentation. He's a professor of physical geography and he's specializing in environmental modeling. He was also chair of the independent review into the whole floods of 2007. We also have Rob Thomas, who's a senior research, research fellow, and he specializes in geomorphology and flood risk, as well as Professor Dan Parsons, who's a professor in sedimentology and director of the Institute. Um, between us, we deliver the bulk of the teaching and we coordinate and run the modules, which I'll talk to you about in a bit more detail now. So this is um, a typical full-time schedule in, for the MSc in Flood Risk Management. As you can see, we divide it into three trimesters. Uh, the programme itself has been developed with input from the Environment Agency from Hull City Council and with other, from other practitioners and policymakers in order to develop a course that not only is academically robust, but is also relevant to practice and for policy. Uh, the first trimester uh, contains three taught modules. That's the water and the environment, flood impacts living with floods, and flood resilience living with water. These are all worth 20 credits. And these last until about Christmas time. After Christmas, there's a three further taught modules in the second trimester, which are modeling flood events, flood adaptation and mitigation, and then managing flood incidents. These two trimesters comprise the taught element of the MSc in flood risk management, and they're worth a combined 120 credits. After this, and 
after this you'll then enter trimester three in about May time and this is where really where you go into the research element of the MSc and this is where you choose a project uh, or you choose a topic on, uh, related to flood risk management and you pursue a dissertation project which is worth 60 credits. I'm now going to go through each of these parts in a bit more detail to get you, give you a bit more of a flavour of the MSc overall. So the first module is water in the environment and this is run by Stuart McClelland. This is really focusing on the hydrological and hydraulic processes that control how water moves through the landscape. So really from rainfall movements across the land into rivers and it's understanding the flow paths that water follows in order to better manage flood risk. And this includes a lot of practical skills, including using flumes and flume-based work in the laboratory, as well as a series of field visits to locations around Hull and the surrounding area. So you can see this in real life. We also have, we then have module two, which is run by Rob Thomas, and this is on flood impacts, living with floods. This is really about understanding the different sources of flood hazards um, from river to coastal, river and coast side, through to groundwater and sewer flooding. And understanding the different sources and types of flooding can help to manage and prepare for them in future. A key question here is also about how hazards will change. So really recognizing the dynamic nature of flooding and how things such as climate change will affect flooding and flood hazards. It also looks at sustainable urban drainage systems, also known as SUDs, and other strategies that can be used to reduce flood risk and can contribute to developing flood resilience. Module three is run by myself, and this is flood resilience, living with water. And ultimately, it's focusing on the idea that Flooding cannot always be prevented. We cannot stop every flood. We will try our best to, but in some circumstances from extreme weather events, we won't be able to stop it. And we need to accept that some flooding will happen. And this module really engages with that idea and looks at how we can reduce the consequences of flooding. And this also ties into the economic and practical limitations behind some of our flood defenses which means that we can't just build higher walls to hold back the floodwaters. We need to live with water. We need to try and work on not just stopping the floods, but being ready and being prepared in case that flooding happens anyway. And living with floods is really essential for flood risk management in the 21st century. And these, these modules are really comprising, or really make up trimester one. In trimester two, we have modeling flood events, which is run by Tom, who's also on the call. He's really um, looking at, he's using numerical models. Now these are essential tools in trying to understand flood risk management and trying to manage flooding. So we really need to um, understand how we can predict the magnitude of flooding and the extent of flooding. And this can be done using computer models and in this module, you'll be able to model innovative solutions to flood risk and also learn a bit more about predicting flood events. The module also ensures that students can understand how to use and interpret these numerical models. And numerical modeling is really important as a tool to understand flood risks and in managing flooding. Now, you don't need to have a background in modeling, and this is aimed at a wide range of different audiences. And Tom's, Tom's a very good lecturer, so I'm sure he'll be able to guide you on the journey to really understanding how to model and how to use these numerical models. We then have the uh, module five, which I coordinate, and this is on flood adaptation and mitigation. This is really building on what we've learned in the first trimester, and it's thinking on thinking how can we go beyond only building walls and concrete defences to protect against flooding? How can we manage flood risk through other adaptation and mitigation measures? For example, using natural flood management techniques in order to try and slow the water and to avoid having to build these walls, which might be ugly, unpleasant to see, but also expensive and potentially, uh, they can potentially fail. We'll also look at the social dimensions 
of flood adaptation and mitigation, and really understanding how we can make more flood resilient cities through flood warnings and looking at flood risk perceptions. Um, we'll also have experts coming in to explain different schemes in and around Hull, but also in different countries. So we have a very global perspective on flood risk management. Module six, uh, I also coordinate this module, is on managing flood incidences. incidents. As I mentioned, we can't stop every flood. We need to be prepared for when flooding does happen. We need to think, how can we reduce the consequences of flooding? We'll be looking at effective flood responses to try and reduce the impacts of floods. And we'll be looking at previous flood events to see how we've lived with them and to identify how we can learn to manage them better in the future. We'll be looking really, well, we've got a lot of expertise in this, um, in this uh, field in managing flood incidents, and we're trying to understand how to best apply that. And we'll have practitioners coming in to share their insights. And in this sense, bringing you both the perspectives of theory, but also how you can use it, how you can take that away with you from beyond the course and apply it to practice and to other um, jobs that you may want to have in the future. We then have the research element of the MSc, uh, the MSc, and this is the Flood Risk Management Dissertation Project. This dissertation project provi provides the opportunity for every student to focus on a topic of interest related to flood risk management. This is really a unique opportunity for you to develop a deeper understanding of flood risk management, as well as to build links with future employers. Now, by the time you come to your module seven and you look at the dissertation project, you would have already had a wide set of experiences from the rest of the MSc, where you've understood it from physical, social science perspectives, where you've looked at flood resilience, when you've looked at modeling, when you've looked at um, also using uh, flumes in laboratory settings. So you will have a broad understanding of flood risk management. And in this module seven, you'll really be focusing in on a topic of interest to you and then setting up your own research design and going out there to really conduct your own research to find out new things in this topic which haven't really been looked at before. Your research in depth and produce your own report. This can also be including external parties and external partners, for example, councils, agencies, consultancies, as well as academic researchers here at the EEI, including the Flood Innovation Centre. Now, that, that's how, what you will learn, but how will you learn it? Well, teaching will be delivered through a mixture of lectures, workshops, and seminars. When we're doing lectures, these are very interactive lectures, so we'll be delivering content, but also setting you tasks and challenges in order to show not only the theory, but give you experience of how to apply this in practice and to how to use this knowledge. We'll also have field work and field trips in most modules, and this will be for you to learn about flood resilience in action. For example, we'll have a tour of uh, Hull as a living laboratory for flood risk management. We'll be visiting uh, urban and countryside areas to see these uh, flood adaptation and mitigation measures in, in practice. We also experience or you also benefit from guest lecturers, guest lectures from international experts as well as sector professionals. Um, last year and also this year, we'll have lecturers from the Netherlands, also people from uh, Norway, from the US. We draw on a broad range of expertise who are guest lecturers connected to our institute. And they come in and they give different perspectives, which can really be useful when understanding it within the program itself. And as I mentioned, the practical teaching to learn hands-on skills, because it's important not just to have the knowledge, but it's also to have the soft skills, the skills on how to apply this um, in the future. And we do this through workshops, through role play exercises, and through serious gaming. In addition to this, we also have personal supervision meetings, while you have a personal supervisor for the duration of the MSc programme, who you can talk to about any concerns that you have, but also any opportunities that, or any ideas you might have about the future. And they can be a sounding board to support your studies here at the University of Hull. The tutorials are also useful. 
and we run these in small groups so that you can really discuss aspects of the courses and key concepts that we, we touch on, but also so you can think about your dissertation project and you can benefit from the range of diverse experiences that your course mates will have. We really emphasize, or we're really um, focused on providing flexible and inclusive study options. And you can study individual modules um, in different ways. And this is really applicable for when you're studying it part time. So you can, what I've spoken about previously was the trimester one, two, and three. And this was for a full time one year course. However, you can also study it over two, three, or four years. And I'll talk about that in a bit more detail. So you can see the range of options that we try and, or that we offer to try and give the best student experience that we can. You'll be happy to hear that there aren't any exams on this course. This MSc is delivered predominantly through coursework from laboratories, uh, field trips, and also in-class assignments. Some of these assignments will be individual, and this might be presenting to a group so you can practice your presentation skills, but they might also be group work. For example, um, either presenting as a group, but also developing um, a policy report as a group. So you get to learn um, by working with different um, people you might not work with normally, and also bring in their views, but also really focus on team working, which is an essential skill. Partnership working, team working, very important in flood risk management. So as I promised, I said I'd go through the different options if you wanted to study part-time. If you were thinking about doing this MSc program over two years, this is how your timetable might look. In the first year, you'd study two modules in both trimesters. So for trimester one, that's water in the environment and flood impacts, living with floods. And in the second trimester, it would be modeling flood events and flood adaptation and mitigation. So that's approximately 40 credits per trimester. In the second trimester, you might also take tutorials so that you can have a better understanding of the dissertation project. In the second year, you'll be really focusing on the last two taught modules, so flood resilience in trimester one and managing flood incidents in trimester two. But then your dissertation project, that the research element will be a key part of your year two. Now, you can start this before trimester three if you want to. If you had an idea that you wanted to um, undertake research with an external organization, maybe with your current employers, then you might opt to try and collect data a bit earlier. And we offer that flexibility and we'll offer opportunities for you to do this. And this can be done by talking to us and talking to your supervisor so we can come up with the best strategy for you and work together to do that. You can also study part time over four years, which, as you can see, is the same modules, but it's one module per trimester. So you do 20 credits and you do that for year one, two and three, and then you have a full year. year four where you focus on the dissertation project and only the dissertation project so that gives you a bit more time and it means you have that extra flex flexibility when undertaking the course and i'm going to end now i'm coming to the end to summarize why should you study flood risk management well flooding is an urgent societal issue it's something that we know is bad we've seen the flood events in the news we've seen them on tv we've we heard earlier about a range of experts saying how important this issue is and how we need to take action on it. We also know this is going to get worse. These flood events are predicted to increase. So we need a new generation. We need more experts on flood risk management because there aren't enough at the moment. And in this course, you'll really be focusing on learning about nature-based solutions, using catchment-led approaches to managing the flow of water to improve flood and drought resilience and really thinking about it from a holistic perspective, both the physical and the social sciences, but also looking at the theory and the application of that theory, the practice, to give you a really good set of skills, a really good set of skills. You'll also be able to develop the skills and cap capabilities to support communities, as well as practitioners and policymakers, to prepare, respond, and adapt to flooding. And you can become a world leader in research and innovation of flood risk management to protect current and future generations. So I'll end here. 
And I'll say once again, this course gives you the skills that will shape the future of flood risk management. And hopefully, I know it's a bit difficult online, but hopefully my passions come across for flood risk management and you've got a bit of energy from that. And I'm sure um, we're, we're looking forward to hearing your questions and hopefully welcoming you onto the course. So thank you for listening and we'll move now on to the Q&A section. Great, thanks that Steve. Um, give you a, a moment to uh, get something to drink and catch your breath. Um, so we've got a few questions that come in. Um, some are quite technical. Um, one of them, I'll start with an easy one, which is how we assessed. And I think that's something that Steve's probably answered in the presentation to a degree, which is that you've assessed via a, a range of different types of assessment, um, which might be reports, um, it might be web quizzes, uh, it may be poster presentations, it may be presentations. Um, am I missing any there, Stephen? No, I, I, sorry, I was catching my breath. Yes, I think you've got them all there. Yeah, um, there, there are, and correct me if I'm correct, correct me if I'm incorrect, there are um, no traditional examinations involved in this course uh, at all. Okay. And some of the modules um, are um, assessed as the module goes along. So it's not just sort of like 10 or 12 weeks of teaching and then bang, hang in a big, big essay. We like to try and sort of spread the assessment as it goes along. So that does really depend from module to module because different modules will, um, uh, different types of content are taught in slightly different ways. Um, so we have a, a couple of questions about the admission process, um, which we may or may not be able to answer, but I'll, I'll um, field these towards you, Stephen. Um, so the um, two questions is, uh, how, how long does it take to get a decision on your application? And linked to that, is there a deadline for applications? So excellent questions there. I'm not sure I have all the answers there for it. I think the most up-to-date information is available online. We try to get back to you as quickly as we can with decisions, but I think is approximately uh, potentially about seven weeks. If you haven't heard from us after about seven weeks, eight weeks, then do feel free to send me an email and then we can follow it up. And if you have any individual concerns about the program or any questions, and we're more than happy to talk to you about it. We, we we are oh sorry Dan over to you yeah th thanks Tom do you, yeah just just quickly to augment that we the the, the um, postgraduate taught admissions team um, have have had unprecedented kind of interest over the past two years and although the team's grown um, the number of applications that we're receiving continues to kind of grow uh, uh, quicker than we can get the team together to process those applications. So, 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 so it's a great success story in a number of ways, but it does mean that there is a little bit of a way for your application to be assessed um, and an offer being made. Um, but my advice to be anybody on the call is, is it's never too early to apply. So, um, so, so if you're interested in coming along, we don't charge a fee for, for applying. So, so put an application in um, and, and then that will get looked at as soon as the team can get to it. Um, but as Stephen said, if, if you've not heard anything after after six weeks or so, please, please do drop us a note and we can chase that up. Yeah. OK, thanks, Dan. So a couple of good questions here about PhDs, actually. So um, does the university in Hull offer a PhD in flood risk management? No, not specifically. PhDs tend to be about um, uh, slightly more in-depth, uh, more um, focused topics than just the rather broad one of flood risk management. But we do have a large number of PhD students, I'd say easily in excess of 10, who are dealing with issues that are related to flood risk management. Okay. And um, uh, doing an MSc in FRM in flood risk management is a way of moving on towards studying a PhD, if that's something you're interested in. That, this doesn't guarantee that you're going to get onto a PhD, but it does provide a, a qualification or a step towards that process. Whether that is within uh, the University of Hull or within the Energy Environment Institute, or whether that's somewhere else. Um, anyone else want to add to that? I can add a little bit. Um, oh, sorry, Dan, you put your hand up, but I'll, I'll, I'll be quick. Um, 
yes, uh, in the research project that you do at the end, this might be a way to really hone in on a certain topic of interest. And in that sense, set you up for a future PhD project, because then you can look elsewhere and you can see what you're really interested in. And you can test the waters a bit in the dissertation project to see if you really do enjoy that. And you would like to look at that in further detail in any potential PhD, whether it's at the University of Follow elsewhere. And my apologies now for over to you, Dan. <laughs> I was, I was gonna I was gonna say exactly the same thing. So so yeah, and and the only other thing I guess to mention would be um that there are there are folks you know who are doing PhDs here that, that have come through similar routes. So so if you want to to talk to any of those, I'm sure we could facilitate a uh a, a, an exchange um with 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 current PhD students who who have who've done master's programs and they can tell you about how how they differ and the the the, the way in which their journey might might help shape your your own. So so do get in touch if you'd like us to facilitate that okay great um so i've got two two questions on here from um two different people um asking about um their applications okay um I, i'm not i'm questions i'm treating questions as being anonymous so um what i'll do is i'll take both of your um email addresses and i'll forward them on to um to Stephen and to joe in the ei and see if they can chase these up for you Okay, so that's uh, answer those. So um, some other questions. Okay, so we have one that says our website says a two one an undergraduate degree in any discipline. Um, do we accept something different, um, as in possibly a, a lower qualification? Well, normally um, we accept a two one bachelor's degree as our requirement or international equivalent, um, but. You know, we're looking for people who have a real interest and a passion in um, in flood risk management, and so you know we will consider applicants from all backgrounds. Okay, um, so you know if if you don't hold that degree but have a have a, an appropriate level of professional background, you maybe you've worked in the water industry or in a related field, um, then that's something we will certainly bear in mind. So while I can't say yes, I think apply. And we take it from there, I think is my advice for, for that question. Yep, nods from, from the other two. Okay. Uh, Tom, can I can I just uh, just briefly briefly augment? I mean, I, I guess that Tom's absolutely right. The the only thing I'd I, I would say on onto that is you know, we try to recruit for potential rather than rather than that kind of background journey but the background journey obviously informs that potential to do it and that's why um the application process takes time otherwise it'd be really tick box very simple thing to do and we wouldn't we wouldn't take a, a number of weeks to to work through the system um but as as tom says but please apply and we we will look holistically um at broader experiences and, and broader potential so so yeah it, it, the, the advice would be to, to put an application in and and let's discuss the the, the merits of that Okay, um, so thanks, Dan. Uh, we've got a question here. Um, I can imagine there are lots, lots of opportunities for engineers in flood-related jobs and tax, tax managers for councils, biologists for nature-based solutions, and otherwise academics for research. Um, where else do you foresee people who would come to this course with diverse skills going on to work? Okay, so um, maybe um, Stephen Dan can think of think this, and I'll and I'll just say that you know from our from our cohort last year. Um, a number of those people have, I think they've all actually got jobs now um, in, a, in a related discipline. Um, Steve, if you can nod if that's correct. Um, I last heard from two or three of them who had gone on, two had gone on to work for an environment agency. I think has one gone on to work for council, um, another one for a flood consultancy company. Okay, um, that's not really answering the question. That's saying, are there any other areas where people can go into? Um, Dan, Steve? Yeah, I think pretty good. I'm happy to start and then I'll pass to Steve and do the other way around. Um, yeah, the, uh, ultimately the, the, the training you get here is, is obviously in a thematic area of, of, of flood risk management, but clearly the skills that you gain during your time on the programme are, are deployable in all sorts of ranges of, of sectors, you know, from project management through to communication skills, all of those sorts of things are built on in terms of your expertise through the programme. So, so the, you know, I wouldn't think of uh, of doing any master's program actually as a barrier to going on and doing anything in other sectors. It's more about augmenting your your skills base as an individual, and and I think the overall kind of 
um, way in which the world of work is is changing is is that that continuing professional development piece is becoming more and more important as people um, reskill and and change their their career tracks uh, a lot more frequently than 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 um, in in the past maybe so 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 yep the, the clearly the, the the MSc is focused within the flood sector but there's a whole range of jobs that this 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 MSc or indeed any MSc would 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 tailored and, and equip you for in terms of a future okay great yeah, and if thanks that oh. if i build on that a bit um sorry sorry about that tom um if i build on that a bit and you you have uh, as tom said a lot of our um call from last year have jobs and it's from the environment agency to also consultancy somebody the other day told me they're now working their lead local flood authority as a flood risk management advisor already which is uh, great stuff and we're always supportive of that, offering references and trying to, if we see anything in our professional networks, we advertise that to our students so that you can see that. In addition to agencies um, and if you're thinking about councils, thinking about consultancies, you might also think about NGOs, both nationally and you could think of the National Flood Forum, um, Natural England, all of these may have some component that includes flood risk management or water management and water resilience internationally as well there are options if you wanted to work for an international ngo so there's a, a quite a broad um, number of sectors that you can work with who do have some sort of flooding or as dan said it's very transferable as well so i just wanted to add that and i pass back to you tom great thanks first to follow on from this i think we may have answered this question with the last one the question is is it possible for someone to get a professional placement after the one year full-time program which I'm going to interpret your question and say that means what jobs might you go on to after the degree. But um, but within that, I just think that's an opportunity to uh, to say that we several, um, some of our existing students have um, done their dissertations in conjunction with uh, with local um, people working in, in the in the flood risk sector, whether that's the council or the environment agency or or indeed uh, environmental consultancy companies. And we, we encourage that and we actively try and get links for your final uh, your final trimester uh, dissertation project um, with people working in this area. And often that may well be a an entry or, or, or an open door in, into a career possibly with that company. And also when you're applying for further jobs that, that can also be seen as experience, which is an important um, criteria for, for moving into em employment in the sector. Okay. Um, are there any scholarship options for the MSc and FRM? Um, do you want me to answer that, Steve, or can you? Or I, I'm happy to. Yep. Okay. So I believe there's details on this on the on the um, on the website on the university website about this, but I can I can read you. What it says if you like for the time being that there is actually uh, what we call the, the vice chancellor circle scholarship very grand name but there's um six five thousand pound scholarships available for um applicants for um for our msc and renewable energy or msc and flood risk management programs okay now um there were quite a lot of people there are probably more people applying for our renewable energy um masters and there were um, flood risk management so it's probably quite competitive for that uh, and the bursary is for students who've been awarded a first class undergraduate degree or meet one of our widening participation criteria okay so in, in particular if you're um, um, engaging in a career move or or from uh, a part of the world that isn't western europe then that that might um, link to those criteria for, for widening participation and to do that you need to write a short statement 250 words or so why you think that's um, important now and um, that is um, there should be details of that within the uh, the web page if not um, if you can't see them then um, get in touch with um, Stephen or myself about this and we can pass that on okay um, I have another question on here as well about uh, about um, applications and um, two here actually from people who've applied in December but not heard back yet. I would anticipate that with the Christmas break, um, that's that's the reason why you, you haven't in that case. But but I will. I've got your emails here and I'll pass pass that on. Dan. 
Yeah, I was just going to say that, that um, we, we have provided um, that we know that there's quite a, quite a big backlog within the, the postgraduate um, admissions office. Um, they're looking to clear any applications that have been received as of last week by, by the end of the month. So, so I think that that, that Christmas backlog should be cleared by the, by, by the by the end of January. Um, so, so just to give a time scale for, for people who are who are out there, obviously considering um, considering where their applications got to. Um, but yeah, that's that's what we've been assured by the team. Okay. Um, does anybody have any other questions? It's a really good set of questions we've had there. I'm just checking through them again, see if I've missed any. No? Okay, Dan, Steve, any final points you want to make? Oh, here we go. Oh, one's just, late one's just come in. Thank you. Uh, will achieving a professional qualification such as an NEBOSH and NEBOSH in uh, environmental management be an additional advance to receiving a positive decision on an, administrate, on an admission? Okay, so that's um, whether um, gaining gaining qualification before applying. It, um, it it will help. Uh, okay, um, I, I think if you meet our additional criteria, our existing criteria of having a, a two one degree and uh, and I believe it's some some level of experience in uh, in having maths and meet the language criteria that the, the university require, then you won't need this, okay, this qualification, but it it, it won't hurt. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, absolutely right. I think I think that that speaks to that broader experience um, that that people might come to with with a, a diverse background, and we're obviously keen to 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 to, to look at those those um, you know more more non traditional journeys that people have been on and and, and um, explore those. So so please do apply and uh, and and we'll we'll take a look at all of those applications on their merit and additional um, qualifications such as NEBOSH and others do do obviously demonstrate what you've been doing and and, and that trajectory. So that that is important to to include. I guess the only other thing I was going to mention, if there's no other questions, and, and Stephen, I didn't know if you wanted to mention anything about accreditation more broadly. Because clearly, um, you know, the NEBOSH type qualifications and professional qualifications, um, what, what we do with accredited programmes and things like that that we're looking at for this programme might be worth just mentioning that to folks around CUM and, and, and those, those opportunities. Uh, yeah, we're looking, um, so you, you may know CIWEM uh, in, in related to water and environmental management and they're a chartered institute. And we're looking um, at getting the course accredited so that you will have that as well. We're in the process of doing that this year. We hope to have it done by the end of the academic year. So it'll be all ready for you if you were to join. And that's an added um, qualification or is something which shows that you have maintained a certain level of um, knowledge or expertise on a very specific topic, in this case, flood risk management. And this can also help you by having done a SIWEM accredited course on the topic. And yeah, I think that's the key thing. Great. Um, thanks for thanks for all your questions. That's really good. Um, I think I've got nothing else to add. And um, well, um, look forward to maybe seeing some of you um, in September. And uh, and I uh, hope, uh, hope the application process goes well and bear with us a bit on that. Anything to? Good. Well, thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thank good, to, good to see you. Thanks, Tom, Stephen, and thanks for everyone tuning in. See you soon. Great. Yeah, thanks for tuning in. See you soon.